Serious question. Is the American dream dead? It's Brian Preston, the money guy. Yeah, Brian, I'm excited about this uh, show because I think this is going to be one that's a little surprising, right? So uh, a lot of folks have saying, you know, things are different. Times are different. We're in a new paradigm. We're in a new shift. And one of the things that's been affected by that shift is the traditional idea of the American dream. Bo, if we were defining American dream, walk through what exactly was the American dream and why is this even a thing? Yeah, so the American dream, you know, back back in the day, it was a marker of success. It was the thing that said, hey, if, you know, if I am starting out on my journey, I'm going to pursue this thing. And if I accomplish these things, it will mean I was successful. I've done the things that I was supposed to do. I've ended up in the place I'm supposed to be. And that was the American dream. And, and I see Daniel put the white picket fence yep. in, in the thumbnail there. Um, so we're talking about the basics here of like owning a home. Yep. We're talking about getting married and then having a family. Was were those kind? Of, is that really kind of the cornerstone? That was it. Of, that was of the American dream: career, family, home ownership. Like if you had those three things, you were moving in a positive direction. And why were those societal norms kind of? what was considered good. Yeah, I think the big reason is they were in, they were individually markers of success. And there were some interesting things, there was an interesting study that came out that said if you had these markers of success and they define them as number 1, graduating high school, number 2, working full time after high school, so that would be a full 40 hours a week after getting a high school diploma, and then number 3, being married before you began having children, and also not having children before you attained the age of 21, if you could do that, the statistics would suggest you had a higher probability, higher likelihood of having long-term financial success. Well, it's only, I mean, it also kept you out of the ditch financially. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, look, lots changed. Pandemic, you know, more of a a smaller global Mm -hmm. world. What is this? I mean, why would we even run a show that hits on this? Why? What? What's the actual results? What's the shock and awe stat on why these things were so powerful in the past? So this is what the study found out. This is uh, data from the Brookings Institute and the Urban Institute. For those that follow all three norms, so high school diploma, uh, no kids before marriage or no kids before 21 and working full time, the poverty rate among those from people who satisfy all three of those, is a shocking 2%. Wow. If So that means that 98% of the folks, if they just did those three things, they were above the poverty rate. They were not living in that sort of realm. That, that number is bigger than I would have thought, I mean, meaning smaller than I would have thought in the fact that 98% of people, if you just graduate high school, have a job, get married, and have children mm-hmm. in that effect, meaning you get married before the children come, 98% you're not going to be poor. That's right. And then I think it even cuts on the other side. Again, why was the, um, if that's the definition of the American dream, why was the American dream a thing? This study done by the Brookings Institute found that for those that break all three of these norms, so meaning they, they don't get a high school diploma, don't work full time, and then have children either early or before they get married, they actually have a poverty rate of 79% of folks who break all three of those societal well, When we were pulling this together, and Daniel showed me this slide the first time, I was like, when was this done? Is this mm-hmm. from like 1986? How old is this data? And Daniel assured me, he's like, no, this I pulled this. This is as of 2018. They update this every yep. few years. So it's kind of amazing to think about these simple behaviors can keep you out of poverty. And if you need perspective or context, the, the poverty rate in the United States is 13.7%. So you can quickly see that this saves you, this this cuts the opportunity of beco- be living a life in poverty down to where it, it's, it's minuscule. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a, it's a seventh of what it would have been. That's something to dive deeper into. Mm-hmm. So let, let's kind of talk about this because I want to know we know what the basics of the American dream were. How's that evolved? How's that changed as, 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 as we've kind of reached this new modern world that we live in? So we thought what would be interesting is to talk about the individual components that made up the American dream, mm-hmm. what they were, why they were that way, and then potentially if it has shifted or if it has changed, how has it changed? And the first one I don't think is incredibly surprising. Uh, it was 
employer loyalty, staying with one employer for a long period of time. And in a lot of circumstances, previously it was staying with an employer for an entire career. Do you think, Brian, that that has continued to be the case or has that changed through time? This has definitely evolved. I mean, I just experience share. I think about my father-in-law. Um, he got the cold, gold watch moment mm-hmm. where, you know, you work at a place so long, he worked at a utility company that he literally got a, a Rolex on his retirement date. And that was always what you saw that people were working towards. There's no way that's that's the case nope. anymore. I feel like so much has evolved, so much has changed that the loyalty towards your employer is 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 just different. And this is actually now proven even in the in the statistics. According to data from Zipia, the average person will change jobs 12 times in their yeah. lifetime. So it's no longer I start with one employer and I work with that employer for a 40 or 50 year working career. There's a lot of movement. There's a lot of change amongst the jobs that people are carrying. So I don't know that employer loyalty is quite as big of a thing now as it once was. Well, let's talk about why has this evolved? Because there have been some macro things that have happened in the business world that have changed why it's not as important to stay with one employer. Mm -hmm. So kind of reviewing what was successful in the past, why did people stay with one employer only? Well, I think the big thing, there were some financial reasons to do that. And one of the ones I think that was the the largest, uh, maybe golden handcuff, if you want to call it the reason, is these would be these things called pensions. We had defined benefit plans where if you were willing to work with an employer for 20, 30, 40 years, that, hey, so long as you're here, you put in your time, you take care of us in your career, we will take care of you in your retirement. We will guarantee some stated level of benefit for you. Well, I think companies began to wisen up and recognize, man, these pensions are kind of expensive. They're hard to kind of continue to carry out, especially as we have a workforce that's living longer and longer and longer. So we are seeing a lot less pensions today and a lot less pensions over the last couple decades than we had previously. Yeah, I mean, the big catalyst factor in there is go look at the legislation that brought us 401ks. Uh That all came about in the late 70s, early 80s. And and we even had a stat of the number of pensions that used to exist, but then the change and the evolution of how many 401ks have grown to kind of replace um, that relic of something that we all kind of I mean, I'm still jealous of our, you know, of some of our clients that come in as teachers yep. or as, you know, civil servants, as police officers, as fire, you know, firemen and women. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's kind of amazing how this has evolved. Um, just looking at the stats. Yeah, what's wild is in 1975, the total number of defined contribution—that's like a 401k type plan—was about 8,600. But when you look at the total number of defined benefit or pensions, it was about 20,000. And these are for uh, large employers that had greater than 100 employees. Well, fast forward now into the 20 teens, and you can see that pensions have dropped from 20,000 pensions out there publicly available to only about 7,700. And yet, defined contribution plans, 401k, 403b type plans for those employers has skyrocketed from that 8,600 in 1975 all the way up to almost 85,000 by the end of 2018. Well, what I think is really telling on this, no doubt, as we've gone through the years, part of what we talk about innovation, opportunity, there are a lot more employers than there were in 1975. The number of the pie is much bigger, and that's a good thing. But I do think it's quite telling that here we are, and this data ended at the end of, is this 2015, 2016, there were... You know, you can see the number went from 20,000 pensions in 75 to now 7,700, even though the pool of employers is substantially yep. larger. That that shows you how this is just not something you see very often. This is more of a rarity than the, the norm it was just a few decades ago. And I think this is why, because if you look, because remember, these are large employers, folks that employ, uh, companies that employ over 100 people. Among these large companies, and that and two-thirds of the entire American population works for a company that falls into that category. So 67% of people work for those corporations. 401ks or defined contribution plans now outnumber these pensions. And you can see the number here is by a factor of 10 to 1. So yeah. if you are someone who has access to a pension, recognize it is something very, very unique. But I, I think because they don't exist as much anymore. There, there is less incentive for employees to stay with employers 
for longer periods of time. Yeah, the golden handcuffs have changed. And the mm-hmm. fact that it was a defined benefit, you worked, gave them enough years, you knew exactly what your retirement looked like because it was a defined benefit. Now we've got a defined contribution yep. where the outcome is not guaranteed. And I, I think that kind of goes along the line because here's the next reason why I think people stayed with the same employer in the past geographic limitations. Yeah, it used to, uh, whenever you found a job or you worked with a company, you kind of moved and went to where the work was. If you grew up in a town that had a specific industry, odds are you worked in that specific industry. So you were somewhat geographically limited in terms of where you could do the job that you were going to do. Yeah, that was not the case. In the past, <laughs> you had to get to work. And I think about it, the pandemic has actually accelerated mm-hmm. this. I mean, I will tell you the move to virtual living with uh, the way we work, the way we communicate seems to have accelerated. And the fact that I, I thought this stat was quite telling. By 2025, we are expecting or our employees are expecting 22% or close to a quarter of them will be working virtually. And I think that's why, you know, we kind of looked around our content team and in the meeting that we were having, we had four of our content team members in there. We said, you know, statistically, one of the four, if this were a normal organization, would be working completely virtually. That is something very, very different that did not exist or almost, almost did not exist 30, 40 years ago. I think this creates a unique opportunity. I always like to look for the the unique optimistic thing. We talked about when we were growing our business because we've had a virtual experience with, we mean, we work with clients all across the country. I love the fact that we were able to take advantage of a lot of people in the Northeast, a lot of people on the coast and in, in, in the West Coast felt like they were poor in their mm-hmm. community, even though they had seven-figure seven portfolios yeah. just because they were comparing themselves to everybody around them. Meanwhile, here we were advisors in Georgia at the time. We could service these people, and they would be great for us. It really created an opportunity. Well, same thing's about to happen with workers and employment opportunities is that, look, you could live in a low-cost-of-living area – still get a great job from someone in a different in a state. Cost, yeah. and, and it's still a benefit to the company because if they're so used to paying the salaries, the rents, and everything from San Francisco, but they can go hire somebody in Alabama mm-hmm. to do it, you can see that there's lots of opportunity for all parties involved. Yeah, and I think the, the last sort of point in terms of why people aren't staying with employers as long as they once were is now it is easier than ever to acquire and attain new skill sets. Yeah. It was difficult, you know, 50 years ago to go gather a new skill set. So whatever you started doing at the beginning of your career was probably what you continue to do. Well, we have a number of clients, Brian, that they might be on their third or fourth career in the third or fourth industry and they haven't even gotten to retirement yet because it is so easy to add new skill sets and to develop new skills in this sort of flat world that we live in. I saw a comment just this morning on on the YouTube channel that said, everything I need to know I can find on YouTube. It's 100% true. And it is amazing how much of our life and access to information has been revolutionized by technology. So that, that is also translated to opportunities for you to to make money off of that, to work off of that. And that, that's a, pretty exciting. So let's pivot from the work environment, because that was a, definitely one of those primary cornerstones of the American dream, to let's talk about marriage, because sure. that's definitely evolved, and, and we've had a lot of movement there. Give me some stats on this, Bo. Yeah, I think what's really interesting is when you look at uh, how many folks are getting married and when they are getting married, the numbers are really, really interesting. Back in 1960, again, this is data from Pew Research, men got married at an average age around 22 years old. Women got married around 20 years old, and about 72% of all adults were married in 1960. So uh, folks were getting married early, and it was a common thread to get married, to find a spouse and to get married. Well, fast forward now to present day, on average, men now are waiting till age 30 to get married, Women are waiting until uh, average of age 28 to get married, and only about 51% of adults are married. So people are waiting longer to get married or making the decision not to be married or not to stay married. So it looks very, very different today than it did back in the 1960s. Isn't it interesting that both genders moved, pivoted by exactly eight years? Sure, yeah. I mean, that, that that's interesting to me. And then I also think it's interesting to see the stat of more people were getting married. But, but here's the silver lining in that smaller number. Because when you see that, you're like, oh, that's kind of sad. But then here's what I, I think is interesting. 
in recent years, we found out that there's less divorces. Mm -hmm. So it does appear, because oh, look, I, I, I'm a, I, despite what is out there on our YouTube comments, there's a lot of people telling you how horrible <laughs> marriage is. I actually have found marriage to be pretty good. It's been pretty awesome. Um, so so it, it's one of those things where I, I at least like the fact, if you're looking for a silver lining or turning lemons into lemonade, is that it appears when people, even though they're delaying the decision, it's sticking more. Mm -hmm. You're seeing a lot less divorce. And that's important because divorce is a disaster when, when, if you think about that. So let's talk about some of the financial implications of marriage. You know, why was marriage an indicator of success and why was it part or is it part of the American dream? Well, there are some financial advantages to marriage. We just kind of wanted to go through and list a few. Uh, the first is a pretty easy one that most people don't think about until they get to retirement, that uh, when you're married, you're eligible for Social Security spousal and survival benefits. Yeah. So even if you uh, get married and decide to have kids and maybe one of the spouses uh, decide to stay home and they don't pay in the Social Security system, it's structured in such a way that even if you have one working spouse going out and paying into the system, when you get to full retirement age, you have actually have a retirement benefit on your behalf based on your spouse's working record. So as you can imagine, for folks in their 60s and 70s, this is a huge income source of money that might not have been there otherwise if this system were not in place. Um, just pulling off of my, my 16 years of tax preparation, public accounting background, I put may on this on purpose, is that you may benefit from an income tax mm -hmm. break. Now, look, for years we had marriage penalties and other things, and that was something to pay attention to because it was a unique thing that two professionals that had equal incomes, it was kind of a marriage penalty. penalty yeah. A lot of that's been resolved, but there's still a planning opportunity if you have one high income spouse and one low income spouse, there's definitely a benefit when it comes to the tax rates sure. um, if, if you have a big disparity in, in who makes what within the household. You know, another benefit is that if you are married, there are additional savings opportunities. Again, even if only one spouse is working, but you have enough earned income to cover both, you can actually do spousal IRA mm -hmm. contributions. So if you're putting money in a Roth, even if your spouse doesn't work, it's an additional savings mechanism where you can fund IRAs for that non-working spouse as well. Um, when you move, I mean, think about your primary residence. If you own your home, a single individual, if they've lived two of the last five years in their primary residence, can avoid $250,000 of capital gains. A married couple can actually do $500,000. So there's a huge tax benefit when you're talking about primary residence. And right now with the real estate market being white hot, mm -hmm. this is a huge opportunity too. Another benefit is that uh, there are much more generous gift tax and estate tax provisions for married couples. If you're thinking about passing wealth on to your spouse, it's much easier to do when you're married than if you are non-married individuals. The exemptions are higher and even the tax rules surrounding how they're treated are different among spouses. Yeah, I mean, there's no gift tax between spouses. You can give on limited to your spouse. So that's something to pay attention to. And then don't forget some of the, the general insurance coverages. We're talking about health insurance, military benefits, veterans, you know, all those type of things where, or pensions, where your spouse might be eligible for benefits. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of opportunity there. So the, we just laid out all the benefits but what else is going on out there? Yeah, you said one thing a second ago, Brian, that I think is worth touching on. You said it's uh, divorce rates presently, even though less folks are getting married, divorce rates are at a 50-year low. And you may wonder, well, from a financial perspective, why does that matter? Why is that significant? Well, we know, and this is according to research from the Foundation for Economic Education, that those divorcing experience an overall drop in wealth of 77%. So one of the most catastrophic events that you can no. go through from a financial perspective is going through a divorce. So the fact that less people are getting divorced now is a positive sign economically because less people are having to suffer through this 77% decrease in overall wealth. Well, we know just attorneys alone are going to typically cost you around 11300 That's a, That's what the average attorney's fees are for a divorce. And it can, by the way, that's the beginning. It can get a lot more yep. expensive than that. So divorce is just bad all the way around. So we've covered, we've talked about how working has changed. We've talked about marriage and the changes that have occurred there. Let's talk about the other component of the American dream, which is home ownership, that white picket fence now, I was going to say, that's what you always hear. You're going to buy the farm and you're going to have the white picket fence. And that is part of the American dream. Well, one thing that's been interesting is we now live in 
a much different place than we did a number of years ago. It's a little bit harder, especially depending on what part of the country you live in, to get into your first home. Mm -hmm. And also, if you've listened to our show for any amount of time, you know that we say a home should be a five to seven year decision. Before you actually buy your first house, you wanna make sure you can be there for a long time. Well, a lot of folks that are just coming into the workforce, they don't know where they're gonna be in the next five to seven years. They don't know if they're gonna stay in this city or move to another city. So one of the trends that we've seen is that the median age of first time home buyers is at an all time high right now at age 33. Yeah. Most folks don't buy their first house until 33. For some contrast, back in the 60s, the median age was around 24 or 25. So people are buying into homes much later than they were 60 years ago. So that's that's a little stock, uh, shocking because that, you know we all know in the 30s you're kind of in that messy middle. Sure. A lot of things pulling at your at your wallet and your you know and, and trying to get access to your money. What I find interesting is even though people are waiting longer. There's actually more homeowners now. Mm -hmm. Now, this might be a population thing because it's just sure. the, the, the number of people here in the United States is much larger now. But it still is interesting that there are more people with homes now than there were in the 60s and 70s. I think that's a positive thing. Um, but it, it is interesting that we've gone from early 20s, you know, kind of early to mid 20s, to now we're almost mid 30s before we're getting that first house. So the question then becomes, you know, buying a home for most folks is probably the single most expensive thing you will ever do. It might be the largest financial tract and uh, financial transaction you ever have. So if that's the case, why is home ownership one of those markers of success? Why is home ownership something that helps people lead to financial success? And what we think the answer is, there are some advantages, specifically on the tax side, to owning a home. Yeah, I mean, this one, and this one made me cringe, uh, you know, a, a little bit in the fact, I, I know we talked about the, the, you can exclude a portion of your gains, but then the second part is, it's leverage growth. Now, this mm -hmm. one makes me feel a little icky for drawing attention to it because debt is one of those tools that can be very dangerous. But it is true. Most people, because lenders know that you don't have to put down a full 20% on your mm -hmm. primary house because you're less likely to walk away from it. It mitigates their risk because you're going to need shelter. That's right. And so if you are putting down a small down payment, financing the rest, and then you reach a marketplace, like a real estate marketplace, where the house is appreciating that leverage debt actually creates a multiplying or an amplification mm -hmm. effect on your wealth creation. And what's beautiful about that is the tax code has been written in such a way that even though you are having that leverage growth, and even though it is probably going to be the largest asset that you have, which means potentially when you sell your first home, it's going to be the largest gain you've ever had from an investment standpoint, you can actually exclude all or a portion of the gains from the sale of your primary residence. Single filers can exclude the first $250,000 of gain, and those that are married can exclude the first half a million dollars. So it is an opportunity for a lot of tax-free wealth building. And I think that's what a lot of people see as they transition from their first home to their second home to their third home. By the way, any of you home builders out there, this is my like my home builder. He moves every two yeah, to three of years. He's he a does. nomad because he takes advantage of this 500,000 every two years. Pretty powerful stuff. Um, you know, this is something that used to be a little more powerful, itemized deductions mm -hmm. for, yep. for mortgage interest and taxes. The thing is, standard deduction has gotten so big for married couples, you don't see it as much, but it depends upon how big your house is, how big your property taxes are. But there's a chance that you will get a tax benefit on lowering your income through deductions by having a house. And then, you know, sometimes this was back in 2008, there were even first-time homebuyer credits where you actually get a tax credit for purchasing a home. There has been some talk about potential that happening again. We're just, but there have been times through history where it would actually not only lower your taxes in the normal itemized deduction, but you actually get a true credit for when you purchase a home. So there are some financial benefits from home ownership. I think, Brian, one of the biggest ones though, because we already said, you know, one of the biggest expenses we ever have is a home. One of the things that people don't realize is happening in the background when you get a mortgage and when you're paying that. Every one of the payments you have, yeah, there's some interest that you're losing. But part of that's going to pay to the principal of the house. So it's a little bit of a forced savings mechanism for most households. No, no doubt. This is one of the, and I see you guys, when you write this on our comment section, 
you just that's what you that one of the benefits of why you're talking about paying down mortgage debt mm-hmm. so quickly is you're like at least you own your house and it's a forced savings opportunity because most people just don't have the discipline to go create wealth mm-hmm. by investing it out there in the marketplace. So I, I do agree that this is a forced savings. I'm just saying make sure you figure out how much is required mm-hmm. and, and then how much do you save for your house, but also put the money to work. I do think, and this is very timely mortgages and having real estate is a great hedge against inflation too. For because sure. think about this. We're we're in a marketplace right now where mortgages are at historic lows. We're gonna look back in 20 years and go and and be shocked that we could get 30 year mortgages for two and a half percent. Because when we hit inflationary periods, the value of your real estate goes up. Potentially in the long term, interest rates will go up. Yet your mortgage is locked in at two and a half percent. It's a great inflation hedge as we experience those type of concerns right now. So, okay, we've talked about employer loyalty, and we've talked about marriage and starting that family unit. And we've talked about home ownership, but if you remember, there was one of the things uh, in terms of the three markers of success that would either increase your ability to live in poverty or decrease your likelihood of falling into poverty, and that was the decision that you make around growing the family, around having kids. And remember, they were saying the order you want to do this, marriage mm-hmm. first, and then you want to be post or 21 years of age That's or greater, right. that would keep you in that 98% avoiding poverty. And if you broke all three of the tenets of high school education, having a job, or then having children pre-21, pre-marriage, 77% of people who broke all three of those That's tenets right. were headed towards poverty it, you can see how kids make a big impact. And we understand this. We t- do a lot of content talking about how the, the kids, I mean, they're great, long-term fulfilling, but man, are they expensive. <laughs> they are. There is a lot of economic impact to children. You know, it's really interesting. J- just like the um, age of home ownership has shifted, uh, the age in 1970, the average age for the first child born for women was at 21.4 years old. So if people were coming out of college early on in life, and they were having kids pretty early. Well, fast forward to now 2017, the average age of women having their first child is at 26.8. So it is five years later. So not only are individuals waiting longer to buy homes, they're also waiting longer to have families and to start kids. Now, you and I are both girl dads. Uh huh. We, we have two daughters. You just said something there that kind of, I, I don't even re- know if you realize you said, Uh-oh. you said after college or they were working through, I, I would say if the average age for birth to be back in the, the 70s at 21.4 years. Oh, yeah, I guess. I don't think a lot of those ladies yeah, are going to college. I mean, I think that that is a big change I has think occurred. That has and us being girl dads, we just assume. The girls are going to go, go to college. I mean, that's I think right. That, and I think that is probably an evolution of how things have mm-hmm. changed. And that's why you're also seeing that age get pushed out on when people have children. And I think there's this realization, you know, just like homes are a very expensive financial undertaking. So people are waiting until age 33 to buy their homes. Kids are a very expensive undertaking as too. We know that for a middle income family, USDA says that the average cost to raise a child from age zero to 18 is about $234,000. So it is a big economic decision when you decide to have a child. Well, when, you, when I saw 234 to raise a kid, I was like, that sounds like a lot of money. So, but I asked Daniel, I said, Daniel, does that include college? And he's like, nope, nope. That's zero to college. 18. Because so that there's another step in this. And this, unfortunately, and, and I talk about this all the time in content. I think that this is because this is a bad thing is because education is your ladder up. I mean, Mm -hmm. Bo and I both come from humble beginnings. I attribute a lot to the ability to be a good student, take advantage of learning as much as possible, being a student of life, and then using that knowledge to pull yourself to higher and higher levels. So there's a lot of societal things that you benefit from focusing on education. Mm -hmm. The unfortunate thing is, is that it almost is like the institution realized that people are going to do it. And there's now a much higher premium Mm -hmm. to getting education. Because if we go ahead and transition post 18, you can see the cost of college from the 70s to now is, is, is we're, you know, in the, the 2020s. Instead of it being, 
you know, nine thousand, a little less than nine thousand dollars a year. And by the way, this is inflation this is adjusted. adjusted for today's this is not, dollars. It, it was actually much, much cheaper in the seventies to go to college. Daniel brought this forward so we could think in not old terms of what money was, because then it'd be like college was a nickel, mm-hmm. you know, and they would, you would have no perspective on it. We he actually brought it forward so you could do an apples to apples analysis, and you can see if. We bringing it forward. College was just under nine thousand dollars a year in today's dollars, yep. and now college costs over twenty two thousand dollars. That's kind of sad that we've had this more too quickly headed towards threefold increase mm-hmm. in something that I consider societally a very valuable thing. So we're talking about markers of success and part of the American dream. And yes, while there are some advantages financially to having children, you know, a, a previous tax code, you would get personal exemptions for the number of kids you have. And now there are child tax credits that you can receive based on the number of kids. So there are some financial advantages to children. In our opinion, what ends up happening is when you make the decision to have kids, it is probably a lot less a financial decision than a life decision. So why in that life decision was that a marker of success for moving in the right direction financially? Well, I think one of the things is it probably adds some stability to your life. It adds some purpose behind what you're doing, why you're doing, how you're doing it, and it prevents you from likely changing locations and moving and doing the other parts of life that do tend to pull on your total network. Oh, but come on. I, I think from a macro sense, it, we talk about, because this is a problem as countries, as they develop, they go from multiple children to the average being like one child. Sure. Is you, you run into, where's the workforce? Yeah, where's that's the, right. The, I mean, so children, having children is societally, you, or from a leadership, from a government standpoint, you need population, and that, that's one of the things that, that you hear a lot of discussion about um, w- when people are talking about what's going on trends-wise around the world, mm-hmm. and it's something to, to pay attention to. But but here's the thing. I think it's it's time to pivot. We talked about the American dream, and it looks like, in a lot of ways, it's evolved, mm-hmm. but still intact. I, I, it's still I think relatively that, the same I think as there are still was. some tenants, some core tenants that they might look different. But it's still a lot of these things, you know, having a job is very powerful. Find it, finding steady relationships can be very powerful. Mm-hmm. Owning stuff, as we see in this inflationary period, very powerful mm-hmm. too. All those things still exist. So I think that that's a positive. But I do feel like we're in a unique time where both there's actually some forces working against mm-hmm. or telling us why the American dream is bad. And so what are the, the factors that are actually working against the American dream. So we kind of thought through this and we're thinking, uh, what are some things, you know, because the American dream is something that used to be um, highly regarded and something that you work towards and something that was like the aspiration you move towards. But yet there are forces, it feels like, that's pulling against that, that's railing against that. And so we're trying to think through what are some of the things that are destroying the American dream or that are having a negative impact on what it once was. And this is sort of the first one that we came up with that we thought about, and it's social media. Well, it's kind of ironic because here we are coming to you, whether it's a podcast, whether it's YouTube, we are we are totally leveraging the benefit of social media, but it's not all rainbows, unicorns. I mean, there's a there are a lot of negative forces that come from from social media, and we have a, a, a quote here. You had written Teddy Roosevelt. Who knows if that's if I it's think truly it was Teddy? I mean, we I could have written like four different names on this, but it's a great quote nonetheless. It's here's the quote: "Comparison is the thief of joy." Now, I remember Brian when I was coming. I felt social media. I feel like was invented in my day, right? right? Like it was invented in my day. I don't remember pre-social media comparison and measuring, like I'm sure keeping up with the, but the ability to keep up with the Joneses, I don't know, was as easy then as it has become today. Would you agree with that? Well, yeah. I mean, because think about it, you in the past and I am, so you're the generation where social media came. Mm-hmm. I'm the generation that has one foot firmly planted in that, what, what people, when they have that postcard vision of mm-hmm. what the American dream is. And then we have now my generation was so old school. It was pre cell phones, pre computers. Sure. Um, you know, 
you had your TV that had the three channels on it, and, and you probably didn't have cable TV. You had the antenna up on your roof of your house. I mean, it, it's all Our the things. Content teams Googling well, it's all the right things that, that Stranger Things is trying to yeah. portray yep. when you watch that on Netflix. I, me and my daughter watched ET this weekend, and and it's almost like they made the set of Stranger Things from the set of ET, <laughs> which you know came out in, in the mid '80s. And, and and here's what I think is is interesting is that I grew up in a life where I had a mom and a dad. We never made much money. I had good friends. I thought I, we were pretty wealthy mm-hmm. because we had, had everything we need. There was not, We had food on the table. Um, you know, I had Shelter, great friends to, to hang out with. I had a, a, access to good education. All that felt very normal. And then I remember I went to college. Mm-hmm. And I was like, holy cow, we're poor. I mean, no, and I know that sounds because there's going to be people that heard me just describe what I had even in in, in lower social sure. economics. And it's still a lot of good things there. But it is interesting when you get to a place where you see true affluence, mm-hmm. where I'm talking about the kids are getting brand new cars, where there's, there's you know, vacations all over mm-hmm. the world, whereas my vacation was, you know, dad was staying home for the week doing honeydew list. Yeah. We didn't really go anywhere go unless anywhere, it was a yeah. timeshare presentation. My parents would go get a free vacation off of. But you had no idea. You, you, you were you not didn't exposed realize it. to that. You didn't know, and, and I think that's different. Now there is no bubble. There's no protection. You are constantly inundated with what you don't have compared to your peers. And I don't think that's a positive mm-hmm. thing. I, I really do think that comparison can, can create a lot of negative things. And that's why there's even some correlations to – Social media leading to depression, anxiety, mm-hmm. suicide. I, I shared also because you know this was something that you and I, you have a little different experience than me. I got bullied in the seventh grade. Sure. I, I'm not going to say his name. I told you in the content. Uh-huh. Meme. I, I distinctly know his name, but in shop class, I got bullied every day by the, this boy, and um, and it just it was awful. It was mm-hmm. it was a horrible experience. But here's the benefit: being my age. It had it had office hours. That's right. I mean, I, I would go to to school, and as long when I was in that shop class, that was the only time he had access to bully me. Mm-hmm. Was really that five days a week for just a short period of time, typically an hour um, or, or or a little bit longer of time. But that was it. I could compartmentalize somebody coming at me. Now with bullying, it's it's like Waffle House. It's twenty four seven access. I mean, you can. You can be bullied, and this is so bad for our, our young people in the world, is that, you know, you can get bullied at home, you can get bullied mm-hmm. anytime, and it doesn't even, they don't even have to be in your house because they're in your computer, That's they're right. in your, your phone. That part saddens me a lot that, that, that any, even successful people, um, looking at myself, and that sounds really weird, but, but just, we all had hardships and weird stuff, and I just hate thinking about if you had 24-7 access to being bullied, do you come out as How well as I change, did? Because yeah. it was easy to compartmentalize, whereas maybe if you're inundated with it all the time and keeping up with your peers, mm-hmm. inundated all the time, that's not a positive thing. Yeah, and I think the interesting thing about social media is is you do have the ability to show the highlight reel. I think it would be wonderful if every time somebody put like a picture of their fancy house or their fancy car or their fancy new clothes, there was like a little snippet of their net worth statement. So you could see if they were truly like up to their eyeballs in debt, you would probably think about that a lot differently. And I think one of the interesting things, because we're not the first ones to stumble onto this, you know, in her book, Dr. Uh, Sarah Fallow in the next Millionaire Next Door, she found that the average American presently spends about 14 hours per week on social media. Well, if you take that and you contrast that, not just to the average American, but to the average millionaire in this country, they only spend about two and a half hours per week on social media. So rather trying to look into and view into the lives of others, they must be spending their time doing something else, focusing on something else, not allowing themselves to get lost in this world that social media creates. Well, I think, and look, we, I don't mind that we're going to, these things are interconnected because mm-hmm. we just talked about spending too much time on social media and that falls right into the next thing that I, the, of the four things that are tearing the American dream apart is the politicizing of everything. And social media, media is all is, about that. I mean, is it, is, it is, it is, it is definitely keeping us at each other all the time. And I hate that because look, there's always going to be differences. Mm-hmm. And, and, and look, everybody probably has 
relatives or friends that have different worldview components sure. than themselves. It's just in the past, they sit under the surface. Mm-hmm. You don't have to know all of your friends and relatives' world outlook or commentary or editorial thoughts on all things. But with social media it's and this out current, there now. You, you, you just get into it. I mean, here's, here's what's interesting. And I'm not going to get into the subject matter, but my wife, because I'm not on, I'm not on Facebook, right? right? Well, I'm on Facebook, <laughs> but I don't actively engage it. You, you yeah. know, you, we use it more corporately. corporately. But my wife was reading to me face a Facebook battle that was going on with like three of my high school friends. Uh-huh. I know all three of them consider all three friends, and they were going at each other. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, who? How is this going to be good? I mean, because they are going in each other's throats on political things, even though these are people that would do about anything when we were growing up Mm -hmm. for each other. Now they're at these points where they're getting into these social media wars on political thoughts. And I I just don't think that's that's beneficial. That's why we have made a focus of the Money Guy show. I don't we don't Mm -hmm. focus on that stuff. I I mean, I, I hate it. When the political world, and sometimes you see it with tax policy and other things, swerves into our content sure. strategy that we do have to address things. But we on purpose want to give you a, a place where you can come get thoughts and you don't have to worry, are we trying to politicize the subject matter? Well, and I feel like you know we're talking about the American dream and using the American dream as a marker of success, building wealth, building towards financial abundance and financial freedom. And it's really interesting, even in this politicized world in which we live now, even the idea or concept of being wealthy has become so much politicized. Yeah. Yeah. Being the person that makes the decision, that goes the road less traveled, that does try to build up to improve their economic circumstance, some people have a problem with that. And some people have even said to us, we've had clients say, you know, I almost feel guilty because of where I've ended up and the opportunities that I've presented. And that seems crazy. It seems like a weird thing now where you're on one side or the other. You're either for something or against it, and there is no middle ground anymore, it seems. Yeah, and that's why I I would encourage you. This is the optimist, glass half full. Try to find where you have common ground, Mm -hmm. because we we have a lot more in common than we have differences. It's hard to see that in the the echo chambers we all created. If you watch that, is it Social Dilemma that's on Amazon, I think? I mean, it shows you how they're using technology to create these echo chambers, Mm -hmm. which is not necessarily because a good thing because I think that there is definitely a skill set. Remember, one of the foundational books I tell everybody to read is that Dale Carnegie, How to Make Friends How and Influence. How to Win Friends it, and Influence it, People. I always get the title wrong. Yep. So thank you for clarifying it. But it, but a part of that is is figuring out where common ground is, figuring out how you can help people together and create those win-win situations. Even though that book was rent, written, I mean, we're coming up on 100 years ago. It is timeless in that our current current world, modern world we live in, could benefit a lot from just respecting and treating other people like they want to be treated. Absolutely, and, and so I feel like again, these things that are that are tearing on and that are that are harming what I, we would say is the American dream kind of build upon each other. Because so not only social media, not only politicizing everything, but we're of the opinion, specifically as it relates to finances, that debt is something that is absolutely tearing apart and destroying the American dream. Because it is so much easier to get now, and it's so much easier to get yourself into a very bad spot than maybe you could have gotten yourself into 50, 60, 70 years well, ago. Well, I think it's interesting. When I was in college in the, in the early 90s, your biggest risk was you signed up for a credit card because they gave you a free bag of potato chips. Sure. And you still, you know, but they'd only give you a limit of like 2000 bucks. So it was horrible. You get yourself in bad financial situations. But what we've done now with student loan debt, where now students, before they're even getting to the starting gate of life, meaning graduating from college with the schools and equipped to go work and make a living, we're strapping them with huge student loan debt. And the data shows that. I mean, the average student loan debt for 18 to 29-year-olds is nine times higher than it was in 1989. And so think about that. If you're a graduate coming out in the late 80s or early 90s, you're thinking, you know what, okay, I've got some student loan debt, but it's okay, I can overcome this. And we feel like we counsel folks all the time that are graduating from college, and they say, man, I'm just overwhelmed. I don't I don't know how I will ever be able to overcome the amount of debt that I accumulated to get out of school. What a horrible place to start your life and what a horrible place to have to try to claw your way out of. Something has to change as it relates to the way people approach getting higher education 
because that's not sustainable over the long term. Yeah, and I know we'll, we'll we'll share some more tips on how to make it through this stuff, but I think specifically when we're talking about student loan debt, guys, pay attention to as you're saving for your children, if you're saving for yourself, if you're in the middle of the throes of this right now, is try to keep your student loan debt to what your anticipated first year of salary is. That, that If you can follow those guidelines, they'll at least let you know where the boundaries are so you don't fall into this. Uh, you know, the, the other parts that kind of close this out is – the behavioral side of lack of deferred gratification. You know, when I talk to high schools, when I talk to colleges, this is the building block. This is in the DNA of anyone who's successful is understanding that we have to take a little bit, meaning you live on less than you make, so you can have that great, big, beautiful Mm -hmm. tomorrow. And I feel like a lot of times societally, this is excluded or people think they can skip this step. Yeah, it's, it's the number one single behavioral thing that you can do that will change your entire financial outcome is if you can learn how to make those small decisions starting early, instead of living for the here and now, living beyond your means right now, make the small decision that I'm going to sacrifice a little bit of today so I can have a better tomorrow. It's amazing how much better you're going to set yourself up. And I feel like what's happening is folks struggle with this and they say, you know what, I'm going to enjoy today. I'm going to enjoy today. I'm going to enjoy today. And then they wake up and they're in their mid-40s or mid-50s. They say, oh, th- the American dream doesn't exist anymore. It's gone. I've, it, th- that's not a real thing. Not recognizing that had they been able to get a hold of some of these things, perhaps they would have put themselves in a different situation. We just covered a lot of negativity. And I almost, there's an ick factor to it because I don't like doing negative stuff. So, Bo, pivot this to how do we actually handle these things because i don't like to leave anybody with a negative sure. situation how do you actually make sure that you're not falling into these four traps and how do you make sure that your version of the american dream is giving you the best version of yourself well here's what we did not say we did not say don't use social media we did say don't have opinions about things we didn't say never utilize debt and we also didn't say hey you should only live for the future and not live for now we think that the way that you navigate all four of these is understanding how to have a healthy relationship with each there is a right and okay and acceptable way to use social media and there's a negative way there is a right and okay and acceptable way to have an opinion even a polarizing opinion about fill in the blank but there's a right way to do that and a wrong way to do it. There's a right way to utilize debt and to better your circumstance, whether it be through a student loan or a mortgage for a primary residence. And then there's a wrong way to do it by going and racking up credit card debt and living beyond your means. And there's a right way to balance. How do I live for the here and now today, but also recognize that the odds are I'm going to have a future and I want to make sure that I'm making decisions today they are going to lead me to that. Having a healthy relationship around all four of those is the number one best way you're not going to let yourself get into a problem that you're going to have a really hard time getting out of. I think there's a, a grounding behavior that get, will go even further is kind of that understanding your why mm-hmm. and knowing where you should go with things. Um, we did a show, and I would encourage you, it's one of our more popular shows out there, The Five Stages of Wealth. Yep. And I love, and I, look, I, I don't like starting a book with the last chapter, but I think there is something to be learned here on the closing step, which is the fifth stage of wealth, which is abundance. Mm -hmm. And that's where you know who you are, you know what you value, and you know what gives you purpose. If you can understand those things, it's going to be, you're just just going to be grounded in the fact that you're not going to fall prey to a lot of the things that that are derailing you and, and really traps that, that are out there all around us in, in this new modern world we live in. Brian, you said something. That, you know, you said there was some negativity around those things. I think that one of the positives is right now I feel like it's easier than ever to build wealth. For sure. Right now sure. it is it is an easier to move towards and accomplish and achieve and attain the American dream than perhaps it even was 30, 40, 50 years ago. Because the world has changed. The world yep. has given us more access that probably was not there before. Yeah, uh, let me give you an a, example on investing and experience here. When I first came out in the, in the in the 90s, but there was even a step before this in these 70s and 80s, your access to investing was called a broker. Yep. And they charge you hundreds of dollars just for the privilege of the transaction through some commission or something. All of that has been done away with. Now you can do 
index target retirement right. funds where you're getting the total benefit of low cost investing. All you have to fit and plus the, you know, the, the knowing how do you do the asset allocation? All you have to answer is how much can I save? When do I need the money? Target index retirement funds have become a very powerful tool in this new modern world. Uh, there are even these zero cost trading platforms. Well, now you don't have to go pay an exorbitant amount of money to open up an account and begin trading and begin playing. A lot of funds, a lot of these target retirement index funds have no trading charges. You can go buy it for free. You have a small internal expense that you pay. It is very, very easy to access this. Whereas just like you said, 50 years ago, the only way to access this was through a professional advisor, professional broker. Now it is at your fingertips from the comfort of your own home, typing on a keyboard. And then we put in here, and this is kind of an echo from something we said earlier, how great is it that the world is smaller, that we can do things remotely? Mm -hmm. I think about the fact we work with clients all across the country. Mm -hmm. I think about the fact my daughter took a college class while we were, she continued her classes while we were down in Mexico. Mm -hmm because she was able to do everything virtually. And you're going, people are going to be able to work remotely. Right. This is all innovation technology has made life a little bit easier here. And then even we said, you know, we were talking about home ownership and some of the geographic limitations that used to exist. Well, I have a house here and I can't really move anywhere else. We even now have exits that you can get out of that that will allow you. We have VRBO and Airbnb. This is a wonderful time where there are options, no matter what it is you want to do or what it is you want to accomplish, there are options available to you that were not available 50 years ago that will allow you to move towards the American dream. And then I feel like it's almost like everybody on the content team was like, man, I feel like Brian just really sold the abundance cycle. He sold the five levels of wealth. So we have a slide just showing you what that, that, you know, there is a screenshot of that most recent episode of the five levels of wealth. Go check that out so you understand how you do go from just barely making it to reaching a level of abundance where you know exactly why you were put on this earth. It's going to be a powerful thing. And then I love how, Bo, this leads to the most perfect closing we could do. Um, you know, we, we start crafting these shows weeks in advance. Mm -hmm. And what we never know is we're crafting shows. And this is why if you want to make yourself feel smaller and know that there's powers that we can mm -hmm. control, we are blessed that we have, you know, Financial Mutants and the Money Guy family where you guys will reach out to us from time to time and say, hey, I'm going to be in town. I'm going to be in the Music City. I'm going to be in Nashville. I'm going to be in the Franklin area. Can I come tour the studio? You guys have mentioned this. I'd mm -hmm. love to come see you. So we had a listener uh, reach out to us. It's been listening for, for quite a time. And he is so active in all of our Facebook groups, the Financial Order of Operations yep, private Facebook group. He's all over this thing. And, and I kind of, I dare say... He's a friend of the family Absolutely. and the fact that when we talk about the Money Guy family, he is the epitome of it. But we could not have timed this any better that, that Chicha wrote, reached out to us and said, hey, I'm coming in town. Can I tour? And then he doesn't know what show we're recording the Tuesday after he's yeah. here. But he's in the office with us. We're doing the tour. And then he says, I got you. I, I need you guys to know my story. Mm -hmm. And and. and, and Guys, I, and I'll let Bo share some of the details, but when as, as Chi was sharing the story, I mean, it's one of those things. I, 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 I felt my hair on my arm standing up. I felt the, the, the goosebumps forming because it just is very powerful when somebody confirms some of the things that right now are being questioned, mm -hmm. meaning is the American dream dead? And then Chi Cha comes in and just blows the lid with just his optimism, his success, and his story is just too good not to share. Yeah, so I, what happened with Chi is he actually came to this country at 18 to go to school. He was yep. from Malaysia and he came here uh, to go to school to study something in the technical field, I think. Some sort of IT is what he went to school for. Uh, well, after college, he wanted to get a job. You know, he didn't want to go back. He was His goal was to come here, finish school, earn enough money that he could take that money and go back home, go back to his home country. Well, uh, he got a job uh, washing dishes in the cafeteria of an IT company. That yeah. was the job that he started doing. And he was like, well, this is great. I'm just going to wash dishes and I'm going to be able to make money. Well, he 
began doing his job really well. And some, I think, of his superiors and coworkers started noticing. And so then they asked him, hey, would you want to start helping out with the cooking instead of just doing like the cleaning and stuff? And he was like, and this, th- these are his exact words. He goes, I was, I was a rice guy, not a cheeseburger guy. So they're asking me to come in and start helping. I knew nothing to... about cheeseburgers, I've... but here they are making him the sous chef of a kitchen. Yeah, so he started out as sort of a line cook, and then he kind of advanced, and then he turned into a sous chef, so he's kind of helping out with the cafeteria. Well, again, he was doing things at this employer, this IT company, that other folks weren't doing. And so it was almost impossible for the other employees, for management, for all the other folks to not recognize that there was something unique about him and something special he was doing. So he just started having conversations and talking, you know, here's who I am, here's what I do, here's my story, here's what I studied. Well, one day, one of the superiors or one of the managers or something. Or an executive. Or an executive, somebody said, hey, you know, I know that this is what you went to school. You know, would you like to get out of the kitchen and would you like a job here? Like, yeah. like in the IT department, not, not working in the kitchen, would you like to actually join the company and he, and, and he was like, oh, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, I was literally washing dishes and then making cheeseburgers, and I got this opportunity. And it's amazing to hear the rest of his story. He said, okay, I'm going to start doing this. And he worked up, and he did that first role, and then he advanced, and then he advanced, and then he And now here he is with a family here, and he is a true blue financial mutant. Yeah. He's actually doing financial coaching now, helping others move along in that path. And he says, if I could tell anybody one thing that's just so unique about this country is the opportunities available in this country are different than anywhere else in the world. And if you haven't seen it and you haven't been there, you don't really understand it. This is the greatest place on the planet and I've lived it firsthand. I thought that I was gonna come here, get an education, wash some dishes, go back home and do what my family's done. Just fall, you know, do exactly what all the other members of my family have done. But because of the dream and the opportunity that exists here, I've changed the outcome of my family, of my story, of my life, and it's remarkable. She said something that I thought was probably the secret ingredient to all of his success. And we talk about this, whether it's job interviews, we talk about it when you're a young person trying to get an opportunity. You have to be willing to do what others aren't willing that's to right. do. You know, and that's, that's one of the best ways to peacock and create opportunity is to really try to do everything you do. You know, Walt Disney, who's one of my heroes – always had this strategy of plussing everything, mm-hmm. meaning that he was going to go above and beyond on everything he did in his life. And I feel like she nailed that. I mean, how do you go from working in the cafeteria and doing it so well that an executive says, you know what, that person <laughs> right there... we got to have him. ...probably is going to be a big enough winner, a success that no matter where I plant, plant this seed, he's going to be mm-hmm. successful. That shows a lot about what type of person... Mm-hmm. You have to be, and I, and I love the story that she shared with us. And like I said, you can't make up the timing of the fact that he came for his tour of the studio late last week, mm-hmm. right as we're recording this show a few days later. I get, I mean, I kind of get chills thinking about it because it really, it is the perfect closing. And I, I just want to remind you guys, look, there's a lot of voices out there trying to tell you this whole American dream thing is dead. The system's working against you. Don't fall for it. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, this is the greatest time to be alive for opportunity from innovation, technology, investing. It is so easy right now to start index investing with low cost. You don't have to do minimums. You can start with as low as possible and just start the process Mm -hmm. of putting your army of dollar bills to work. And if you can just do this behavior, you're going to wake up. 5, 10, 15, 20 years in the future and be like, how in the world? And you get to have that chi moment Mm -hmm. where you're like, this is the greatest place on the planet and I can't believe I got to take advantage of that. And that's what we're trying to be. We're trying to be the wealth seed um, planner where all I'm asking you to do is come water the garden with it, tend to it, and then if you will do this long enough, I know you'll be successful because I want you to learn, apply, grow. We call this the abundance cycle. And and look, this has a selfish motive at sure. the end. And the fact that you do this, even though it might take three years, five years, 10 years, we will be there waiting to help you harvest your crop that gets to be so big, you're so successful that you need a co-pilot and you need a financial planner to take your relationship to the next level and your finances we will be there waiting, and I love being that educator, that voice 
that gives you the grounding to know you too can do this. And look, we are patient. So if you're not ready for that yet, don't worry. We're going to keep showing up. We're going to keep loading you up, adding financial information to equip you to take your finance to the next level. If you've not gone to our website, go check out moneyguide.com slash resources. We have all kinds of deliverables out there for you. We have our financial order of operations deliverable. We have how powerful are your dollars. We have a tax guide cheat sheet. Anything that you want to know, there's a chance we have something in our resources that can help you. We are going to keep loading you guys up so that you can keep moving forward with the American dream. I'm your host, Brian Preston, Mr. Bo Hansen. Money Guy Team, out.